Thank you for coming. It's such a pleasure to, you know, have so many of you coming uh, in the afternoon to come and listen to a talk. So that my talk today is about accelerating innovation. I was very, very interested in the creative problem-solving process in teams. Because, you know, in advertising agency, we are always at brainstorming. And, and some brainstorming sessions are successful, and some are just very, very bad, isn't it? You have gone through that kind of a process. And I became very intrigued by how people behave during brainstorming sessions and creative problem-solving sessions. So I did a lot more research into that. I designed a creative thinking course, a module for students, undergraduate and postgraduate students. And I, and I incorporated all the methods that I mentioned just now, the American, the European, and the Russian thinking methods. I started writing again for Oxford, and then, and then the idea of this professional book in creativity came up again, and I proposed to Oxford to say, what about publishing this book? Based on my thesis, Oxford agreed, and then the book was published last year. And now I'm busy also writing another book for Oxford. So I'm glad to be sharing with you some concepts from my book. I introduced this particular formula because what has intrigued me so far is that there is actually an innovation gap within the industry. A lot of companies, they feel that innovation is very important to the success of a company. But many, many companies don't really know how to make innovation happen. And I give the example of C1 plus C2. C1 means creative ideas, very novel ideas. Okay? Many people can actually come up with creative ideas. But C2 is where you implement the creative ideas in a very creative manner. Because if you don't implement the ideas, what happens? The ideas are just in your folder, your file, and so on. They don't become innovation. Inno innovation happens when you implement creative ideas. So you must have a combination of C1 and C2. C1 of creative ideas and C2 of creatively implementing the creative ideas to have innovation happen. But that doesn't seem to be happening in many companies. They're very good at C1 and they're not very good at C2. So I'm going to share with you some concepts that I extracted from my theory and did a bit more research into the industry. When you listen to me, don't take down every word I say, because that's one-sided kind of listening. What I encourage you to do is to make your mental connections when you listen to me. Because your brain is so powerful that when you listen to a speaker, your mind is thinking at the same time of shopping and what to eat and what to do, different things. Your mind has that capacity. Betul, right? Betul, right? Yeah. So, you know, that's why I encourage you to use your mental capacity to actually listen and think, connect, connect at the same time. Okay? Because if I say black, you may think of something else, you know? Don't just write down black, because that's only my word, really. That's the external thing. For example, I may say innovative companies. Those are my words. Some of you may be connecting, hey, innovative companies in Indonesia. Could be Unilever Indonesia, could be Indomie, could be Tay Bottle. I wrote down these because I was Googling. I was Googling innovative companies. And the one company that keeps on coming up is Unilever Indonesia in Forbes, you know, most innovative companies list over the years. Theory from my thesis was based on the, the theory of creativity catalyst that can actually spur teams to accelerate innovation and creativity in groups. I'm going to talk about modeling, and I'm not talking about, you know, catwalk modeling like that, you know. I'm talking about benchmarking. Okay, benchmarking, talking about role models from companies and people and countries and even nature and you know, even uh, modeling products that may currently not be working because many new innovative products arise because products are not working and that's why they are models for innovation. 
I'm also going to talk about immersing, immersing themes into creative problem, problem solving sessions, whether it's 24 hour kind of immersion or one week or two weeks and so on. Okay, uh, very useful in cultural immersion programs where you immerse into something. I'm going to talk about collaborating because in the world of innovation, you cannot exist on your own, isn't it? Even in a taxi, uh, someone, my colleague was saying, there's collabor collaboration with Co between Kojak and uh, the taxi. Bluebird. So that's collaboration already, isn't it? Uh, to try to uh, make innovation happen faster. Then I'm going to talk about connecting. Connecting all the different ideas and experiences that team members have. Because some of you may be trained in American way and uh, European way, Russian way, Australian way, Indonesian way of thinking. And you have all these experiences. How do you connect and take advantage or, or leverage those experiences? So these are the concepts I want to share with you. Okay, so the question I'm asking you now, who do you model? Who can you model? Person, company, country? Different companies who have different models. Singapore, many, many decades ago, modeled Switzerland, the Swiss standard of living. And that was the vision to drive Singapore. Singapore also modeled Japan because of productivity. And because of that modeling, Singapore introduced the study of mathematics and science so, and has benefited. So you can model different companies or people or, you know, um, or persons, okay? Then, what about this famous person? Why do you think some people model Leonardo da Vinci? Very creative, very multi-dimensional, you know, very cross-disciplinary. He could design, you know, from military to um, bridges and, you know, things like that. Uh, and he was way ahead of his time. And who do you think currently is using Leonardo as a model? A, a famous guy. Bill Gates, you know, he, he was so intrigued by Leonardo's uh, kind of innovation that he actually invested 30 over million dollars just to buy Leonardo's manuscript and display in his office as an inspiration of what is possible. Because Bill Gates is also, you know, innovating in different ways. So even famous people now can use a model from the past. Okay? Steve Jobs, he modeled after Edwin Land, the inventor of Polaroid. Because Edwin Land was able to combine you know, art and science and technology and so on. And Edwin Land was a dynamic presenter. So you, when you watch Steve Jobs you know, presenting, he was a dynamic presenter. It was something that he modeled Edwin Land. Then if you research into Steve Jobs again, you find that the, the younger entrepreneurs, the technology entrepreneurs, actually use Steve Jobs as a model. Google, Facebook, and so on. And Steve Jobs also learned a lot from other people. Sony. He learned from Sony how to simplify the brand name. Because Sony had a long name before, Telecommunication Company of Japan, very long. So Steve Jobs and his partner said, we must have a name short and simple to understand. He modeled. Pixar, because when Steve Jobs was with Apple at first, he was a very nasty boss. You know, he was, if you read the history of Steve Jobs, he was very nasty treating people. But when he invested into Pixar after being fired from Apple, what did he do? He observed how Pixar managed creative people, you know, how to nurture creative talents. So when Steve Jobs went back to Apple, he brought the same principles of managing people from Pixar. Now, Ritz Carlton. What do you think he learned from Ritz Carlton? Hospitality. hospitality. And where do you see hospitality in the Apple company? Apple store. Yeah, excellent. Okay. Now, what do you think he modeled from Nike? Logo. Yes. Simple logo. What else? Steve Jobs told his advertising people, I want a brand campaign like Nike. If Nike can create exclusiveness, reputation for the brand, why can't we do the same? 
So Nike's advertising was a model for Steve Jobs. And it, the agency came up with this campaign called The Crazy Ones featuring geniuses. So I'm going to show you uh, a video commercial of this Crazy Ones. Here's to the crazy ones, the misfits, the rebels, the troublemakers, the round pegs in the square holes, the ones who see things differently. They're not fond of rules, and they have no respect for the status quo. You can quote them, disagree with them, glorify or vilify them. About the only thing you can't do is ignore them because they change things. They push the human race forward. While some may see them as the crazy ones, we see genius. Because the people who are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones who do. This campaign uh, somehow made Apple very exclusive. It opened up the eyes of many people because the campaign associated Apple with geniuses, with you know role models of the past, and also some in the present. There it's elevated the Apple image, and they continued through print and posters and and all that, featuring different people. It was an interesting campaign, and the inspiration of the model was Nike a Nike kind of advertising that is very image enhancing. And that was how somehow Apple with a new image was able to continue on, on a different kind of you know, uh, mission to produce innovative products. You can also model products and nature. I mentioned that you model products because very often you are not very happy with current products. Many housewives have done that. They look at current products, baby products, what, and maybe even clothing products, and they say, no, I'm not happy with these things. So what do they do? They take that as a model, they improve, and then they launch new products. But what about nature? What can you model from nature? Look at some of these pictures. The Sydney Opera House, according to uh, the design articles, the architect, the Danish architect modeled nature. He looked at birds, you know, he looked at shells, he looked at the clouds and so on. And there was even one drawing where he looked at the orange peeling. You know, when you peel up, you get some you know, strips. Can you look at the opera sales? It looks like uh, orange peeling, right? So he modeled from nature, okay? And this particular building in Zimbabwe. The owner briefed the architect and said, I want a building that does not use a lot of air conditioning because then it would be cheaper. So where did the architect get an idea? From nature. The idea came from termites. Termites have a way of building their own kind of you know, house to allow air to flow through naturally. So the model came from termites. Okay? Innovation from modeling nature. You have the Bird's Nest Stadium. Very simple. And below that, you have the Duran uh, building in Singapore. The inspiration was a Duran. You know? Uh, and then, obviously, this one came from the no, ship. Okay? Uh, in the Singapore landmark. I'm sure in Indonesia, many architectural buildings have been modeled after some kind of heritage and, and legacy. Now, you, you look at the one in the center of Nike. It's actually the Nike waffle. Waffle. And the idea came actually from the waffle-making machine because the designer wanted you know, shoes that would have proper grip and that could actually be used on different surfaces. And he was in the kitchen with his wife and they were you know, looking at a waffle machine and the waffle machine has got grits. 
and he went to his lab and he experiment, experimented, you know, using the waffle grid to do the Nike waffle. So, you model products, you model nature. The products may be the current ones that are not giving you the satisfaction, or they could be products like the waffle that could be translated into um, uh, shoes. Uh, if you research into some of the musical composers, they model in nature, water, and, and puddles, and you know, and things like that. And the nature somehow gives them inspiration to compose music. Okay. Okay, I'm talking about immersing now, where you immerse the team into an innovation kind of event. It could be overnight, it could be a few days, a few weeks, and so on, okay? So how do companies somehow immerse employees in innovation, different ways? I'm gonna talk about 3M. 3M is famous for its um, innovation time for employees, the 15%, you know, those who are passionate about an innovation project, a company would allow 15% time to invest in the project. And Google also has something similar, up to 20%. And then you have other companies that, for example, Procter & Gamble, they have an innovation center that they call Clay Street Project, where project teams would go there and then they would you know, immerse themselves using different techniques. I'll show you a slide later on towards the end. They use different techniques to immerse during that period to actually develop new products whether baby products or shampoos and so on. So that's a clay street project where they immerse themselves. Microsoft has got a 24-hour kind of immersion center. They call that the garage. So now there are about 20 garage centers around the world where they have project teams actually immersing themselves into some kind of uh, problem-solving uh, sessions. Why do you think companies like that immerse employees like that very intensively? Sometimes intensity actually, you know, creates this adrenaline, you know, pressure and you have to find some kind of solution over, overnight or within a few days. And that's why you have hackathons. The computing guys, you know, basically trying to create a, a program within teams. And now hackathon has been broadened to other kinds of projects, not just uh, computing. And then many companies have set up labs, laboratories, to actually, you know, experiment and explore, to immerse in some kind of problem-solving sessions. Now, immersing is something that we also do. For example, we send students to Indonesia. We, in the Achichis program, the Australian Consortium for In-Country Indonesian Studies. And the students come here on New Colombo Plan, Kind of funding. So we send students here for six weeks immersion, two weeks language studies, four weeks attachment uh, internship. So that's immersion. We also immerse students in projects. For example, we had 28 students working in teams of three producing a book in nine days. So that's immersion. Immersing intensively in a project so I've been talking about modeling and immersing. Let me move on to collaborating as a catalyst because you need to collaborate, okay? In problem-solving teams to get the ideas, C1, and also to collaborate to implement the creative ideas, the C2, so that you can have innovation. And how do they collaborate? I'll share with you a few ideas. One is competitive collaboration. Competitors collaborating, where competitors collaborate for the benefit of the, for consumers. Now, even soft drink companies, they collaborate to, you know, improve product, like reduce, you know, sugar content, you know, for the benefit of uh, consumers who are so concerned about, you know, so, uh, sugar content. So many companies collaborate. Some companies collaborate to improve packaging that is more environmentally friendly. So competitors do collaborate for the benefit of the community and industry. 
This is an example of a geographical industry collaboration where tourism people with similar kinds of interests from east to west actually collaborate to attract people to this Savannah Adventure Drive. The people who collaborate, different businesses, councils, uh, information centers, and so on, you know, national parks, they all gather together to promote the Savannah Way. What happens if only one place were to promote? Then it won't gain the kind of massive attention, you know, uh, like this uh, collaboration has generated. So it's an industry cluster kind of collaboration, the tourism cluster in this case. Procter & Gamble is a classic example of open kind of collaboration with different people. You look at the example there, the mind map, from retirees to consultants to research labs to governments to retailers to competitors, venture capitalists, and so on. So how open they are. Because the philosophy of PNG is this. If I have 1,500 people who are researchers, and if I open up you know, to tap into the, what's available out there in the world, I can multiply my capabilities and resources many, many times. So that's the beauty of an open collaboration like this. And my favorite story is about this PNG with potato chips uh, product group brainstorming uh, for ideas. And the C1 idea, the creative idea was to print cartoon images on potato chips. And then the C2 kind of puzzle was how do we make it ha happen? How do we implement that? So they searched around the network and they came across a small bakery in Italy that had experimented with printing images onto bread dough. So PNG got into action, obviously, eventually bought it over, and they were able to print, you know, cartoon characters, images of Spider-Man and Batman and Superman onto potato chips to make it more exciting for children. Collaboration. Okay? Now, the other example of collaboration is to tap the wisdom of the crowd. They call that crowd sourcing. There are many crowdsourcing providers. Kickstarter is one of them, Iyeka is another. Many, many professional crowdsourcing providers work with clients. Clients like Coca Cola brief them, clients like Unilever brief them and say, I want to tap into the wisdom of the crowd with this particular brief. You know, you create, design a competition, and then you actually you know, expose that competition online to your target audience. And the consumers online will submit ideas. And then the clients and the crowdsourcing provider will look at the ideas. So you have op open collaboration there, tapping the wisdom of the crowd. So some people use crowdfunding, you know, go online, and they get people to fund certain you know, projects and charities. I've heard of so many cases where you know, they raise funds for cancer treatment of children or medical treatment for children and so on. So that's collaboration, using the wisdom of the crowd. And there is a university network in Toronto, Ryerson University, with this global campus network where the partners of the, in different countries, you can see here different cities, simultaneously share news items, you know, through this particular network. And RMIT has joined this particular network recently in, in May. And we are now working at, as the Asia Pacific hub to collaborate with other partners in the network. So even universities do that. If our students cannot go physically abroad, financial reasons or other reasons, and they cannot go for exchange or study tours, what do we do? We provide global experiences virtually. Virtually. I mean, we also send students to Indonesia, you know, in immersion. But there are many students who need that kind of global experience virtually. So this is what we do. Yeah? Mineral water with fashion designer. That's a classic example of collaboration, you know. Very opposing, but still collaborating. Okay. 
So I have been sharing with you four creativity catalysts about, you know, uh, modeling. You can model country, person, people, place, product. Okay? You can immerse your employees in problem-solving sessions. You can collaborate with the online crowd, with competitors, with industry members. You can collaborate different ways. Even opposing industries like aqua and uh, the fashion designer. And then I want to talk about connecting. Connecting different ideas. Okay? Because in any company, there are employees who come from different backgrounds. Culturally, maybe training, education. They go for self-improvement improvement lessons in creative thinking. So how do you leverage? I want to share with you some of the thinking techniques um, that are used by different people. But first, one classic example is Steve Jobs. He says you need to learn how to connect the dots from your own various examples. And some people have you know, learned from Steve Jobs about connecting different experiences. I want to share with you American thinking, European thinking, and then the Russian thinking. Okay? Some of you may be familiar with American thinking. Brainstorming, right? And the inventor of brainstorming was an advertising man called Alex Osborne. But many people do not know that Alex Osborne also created a second one, a very structured creative problem-solving process at the same time as brainstorming after the Second World War. And this structured problem-solving is very, very rational upfront and then combining creativity. So it's like having the left side of the brain collaborating with the right side of the brain. And he developed this particular creative problem-solving process. Now, if you Google creative problem-solving process, you will find many examples of companies using this particular process, especially the American companies. Okay? And they even have a creative problem-solving institute conference that runs every year for the last 60 years. And they are believers in this particular process I call CPS process. Okay? They believe in this and they attend the yearly conference. And then the other one, Synectics, is also at the same time after the war, same time with brainstorming. But the process is about using analogies and metaphors to, for creative problem solving. And I was trained in that in the advertising agency in New York about synaptics, and that's why I did more research in that. Okay? The European method, lateral thinking. How many of you are familiar with that? Some of you are, yeah. Uh, and who invented that lateral thinking process? De Bono, Edward De Bono, yeah. So maybe Google that. Find out more about lateral thinking. Now, he also developed a very structured thinking method like the CPS process. And he calls that the six thinking hats. Different colors of hats. Sometimes in problem solving sessions, they physically wear colored hats, but usually the hats are metaphorical. So when you know, the team members say, let's put on our green hat, it means it's a signal that everything goes. You can, you, know, you can actually raise any kind of ideas. Anything goes. That's a green hat. Okay? And then when it, when it comes to, say, the, the black hat, then you express your, your concerns and your you know, cri critical, critical comments and all that. That's a black hat. Because there are stages where it's green hat, there are stages where there's black hat, and so on. So if you want to find out more about this structured process, Google uh, the six thinking hats. And obviously, mind mapping. Many of you, I'm sure, use mind mapping, right? And why do you like mind mapping? Tell me. Are you so many of you? Yeah. Why? Easy and creative. And the, the beautiful part about this philosophy of mind mapping is it's natural. Because they say your mind is like that, you know, c connecting different thoughts and ideas together. Okay? Now, how many of you, when you do mind map, you like to draw? You like to draw, yeah. Some of you like to draw 
And some of you like to use different colors and so on. Some use my uh, words and all that. So mind mapping is very popular. In fact, uh, in my doctoral thesis, I use mind mapping to analyze different concepts and, and, and themes and all that. I use mind mapping to connect all the different ideas, to synthesize ideas. So mind mapping is excellent, you know, uh, way of thinking or combining ideas. Then this Russian invention principle, uh, system of thinking. This, this Russian clerk was working in a patent office and he found that people who registered patents had something common in common and he calls that 40 principles. Principles like segmentations, principles like you know, looking at the other way around, principles like deleting something important, principles like merging, things like that. So he had principles of uh, problem solving. And there are companies that actually look at the principles first to see what you know, has been done before by inventors before they actually try to solve the problem. Uh, the famous Mr. Lee Kuan Yew said, every time I had a problem, I would find out who else had the problem and how they solved the problem. You see? The same principle with trees. Who else had the problem and how did they solve the problem? Through the principles. So Google more about trees. They have got a journal online with all the different cases. Remember the, the famous SARS incident many years ago? SARS, the uh, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome? Yeah. There's a very, very useful article on how Singapore used SARS principles to tackle the SARS crisis. Google that and you will be fascinated by the principles that they use, like segmenting the sick from the non-sick by using you know, uh, some kind of infrared system to track uh, uh, temperature and so on. You see, SAR principles can be used to generate innovative ideas. Okay, PNG, classic example. They use different kinds of thinking methods. They combine the American, the CPS, they use synaptic you know, meta metaphors, and they use mind mapping, the European method, they even use the, the Russian method. So they have different people trained in different techniques. And when the people go to the Clay Street project for immersion, they are exposed to different techniques and the facilitator will use Zen, you know, uh, uh, mythology and, and so on to basically get the teams to work innovatively. Okay? So PNG is a classic example, a good model for you. And my connection, looking at all the American and the European and the Russian, there is a pattern. I call it a CIA pattern. There is always a challenge. What is a challenge or what is the problem? And then the next stage is, what ideas can you have for the challenge? And then, what, how can you action it? So it's a C1 and a C2 to get the innovation. Now, when I was teaching... Um, at Edith Cowan in Perth, and I taught them the CPS process, very structured. And then I told them my own connection, the CIA method, and they were grumbling at me. They said, why didn't you teach us the CIA method first? Because then I explained to them, I wanted you to experience what other companies go through, a proper structured way, because that's very popular in the US. My way is to simplify it, because that's how my mind thinks, connecting and simplifying things, okay? And finding analogies also, like CIA, is easy to remember. And the other connection I have is multi-dimensional thinking, like PNG. You know, you think different ways, different dimensions. Just like the opera house uh, designer had different dimensions. He borrowed from nature, not just from you know, clouds, but different dimensions onto a problem. And sometimes when you look at different dimensions, onto the problem, you can actually find solutions better. How many of you have heard of multiple intelligences? Ah, and what do you know about the multiple intelligences? Eight of them, yeah, that's good. Because this professor in uh, Harvard, Professor Howard Gardner, 
He said that each of us has got visual intelligence, intrapersonal, meaning we are very reflective. We are naturalistic inclined. Some of us have green fingers. You know what green fingers are? The, the, the tree, the plants will grow, right? You give me a plant, the plant will die because I don't have green fingers. So some of us are naturalistic. Some of us are kinesthetic. We know how to do needlework, you know, do it yourself, handiwork and so on. Some are good at sports and all that. And then some of us are very musical. Whether you go, go karaoke or whatever, or play a musical instrument, we have some kind of musical intelligence. And some of us are actually interpersonal. We know we can get along with people. You know, we can empathize with people. And then some of us are very linguistic. We use words. And some of us are very logical. You see, these are the different intelligences within you. So when you, when you look at a problem, you may say, you know, how can we use music to resolve this particular problem? How can we use sports? to cast a different dimension to this particular problem. Maybe the aqua people did that, you know, water and looking at a, you know, something visual. What kind of visual element can we bring in to the design of this bottle or, or fashion or whatever it is? So when you bring in different dimensions, you have an, a vast re, kind of resource available to you. Okay? So that's the multi-dimensional thinking. So, I have been talking about connecting diverse elements and you have been contributing different examples. So, that's very good and I, I encourage you to do the same thing, okay? Listen and connect. Form your own connections because when you form your own connections, then the messages become more meaningful. You remember better. Just like I developed CIA, everything becomes more meaningful everything becomes more memorable, okay? And if you use analogies, it will be very, very good. Most of you are involved in English language, language testing, right? Okay, and you talk about the four testing IELTS uh, uh, bands, right? Yeah. You know what I did? I used the analogy of the swimming, uh, swimming medley relay to explain to students in China. I asked them, you know, what kind of sports do you play? Uh, or, you know, participate in? They say swimming. And I asked, because they, some of them are very weak in one of the four bands. And I asked them, if you are a medley swimmer and you have to be good at four different strokes, what are the four strokes? Breaststroke, butterfly, backstroke, and the freestyle. Okay. So I asked uh, the students, I say, what happens if you are weak in, say, the butterfly stroke? What do you have to do as a competitor? You practice and practice and you produce your personal best within a certain time. So I used that analogy and said, in the, it's the same with your four bands. If you are weak in, say, speaking or writing, what do you do? You practice and practice and practice and within a certain time and you set your personal best. And they were saying, oh, yeah. So if you use analogies like that, then it helps. It helps. You know, so sports can give you many analogies. So I can be in a, your problem-solving team and I say, okay, what would Manchester United team, you know, do with a problem like this? Maybe soccer but maybe they have a different perspective and dimension. So, I hope I have opened up your minds to some possibilities. So, I have shared with you four creativity catalysts, from modeling to immersing to collaborating to connecting. Although I presented in that order, you don't have to use them in that order. You may want to begin with, okay, Modeling. Who do I want to model? Or which company? Who do I want to model? And you may want to move on to collaborating. Who can I collaborate with? Consumers, competitors, industry. Okay? Because once you model, you have a vision there. And you want to go ahead. But you cannot work alone. You need you know, to find collaborators. And then you may want to find out, you, do, you may want to find out the kinds of talents and skills your employees have. 
they may want to do an audit. How many of you, of your employees, have been trained in maybe uh, mind mapping <coughs> or brainstorming or Six Sigma or whatever it is? You do an audit. And then you may get them into an immersing kind of event, you know, like an innovation camp. And then you use all those different experiences to produce some kinds of C1 ideas. And then you have to take on another step to have C2 kind of creativity to implement and achieve your innovation. So the process is very fluid. You don't have to be rigid in that sense. Okay? Or some of you may just want to start with uh, immersing first and then take it from there. Because during the immersing sessions, the facilitator may ask, okay, if you have a wish and you could be maybe a company or a person, who would you like to be? So during the immersing session, a very experienced facilitator can ask questions like that. You know? Uh, and then the facilitator may ask, you know, if you could find a collaborator, who would you like to collaborate with? Again, the same thing. And then you take it from there. Okay, so it's a very fluid kind of process.